Hi, it's Emil Guillermo, host of the PETA Podcast. We're still taking a break for the holidays, and we'll be back soon with all new shows, our seventh season. In the meantime, enjoy this encore conversation. This one on the trouble with animal hoarding on this edition of the PETA Podcast. Where's the line between too many animal companions and animal cruelty? If you crossed it, you're a hoarder. Now one shelter head in California says it's a crisis, sounding the alarm on animal hoarding. That's next on the PETA Podcast. Welcome to the PETA Podcast. I'm Emil Guillermo, your host for this inside look at animal rights. Brought to you by PETA, the largest animal rights organization in the world. On today's episode, animal hoarding. Not enough is being done to address it. And Henry Brzezinski, head of El Dorado County Animal Services in Northern California, is calling it a crisis. Brzezinski says animal hoarding is an illness where showing animals a sign of love turns into an addictive collecting and that love turns into abuse. There are more hoarders out there than we realize because part of the deal is not being found out with more animals than you can handle. That's animals both live and deceased and all their accompanying assaults to the senses. That's why Brzezinski tells the public, keep your eyes and ears and noses ready to detect a hoarder environment. The hoarding trend is up, he says, and with the majority of animal shelters full, Brzezinski says even shelter folks have to watch out for hoarders who act as fake rescue agencies showing up to add to their collections. I talked to Brzezinski about all this and more. We began our conversation with how he made his 35-year career that has taken him from South Carolina to California, all in the name of fighting for animal justice. My conversation with Henry Brzezinski on the PETA podcast. I think the first thing was when, you know, I started doing cruelty investigations. When I drive down the highway in South Carolina, it was $200 or 30 days for littering. Again, this is, you know, going back to 1983. But animal cruelty was only $100 for 30 days. It, just the egregiousness that I saw, the abuse of animals. We didn't even have a dog fighting law on the books. Uh, we did have a cockfighting law because South Carolina is notorious for having um, cockfights and, and the rearing of uh, game birds. So that was another project that I took on uh, that was very successful in 1986 uh, to get actually a, a felony animal fighting and baiting act law passed. Um, but Henry, there had to be something, not just about the law, but about the animals that you saw. I seized animals from people and I signed arrest warrants, you know, against these individuals, but it just, it, it seemed like it was a slap on the wrist. I will say this, that um, we were fortunate, you know, of getting maximum jail time back then. And I know things have changed with the, the new mindset about, you know, incarceration you know, over time, I mean, I've, I've seen people, you know, go to jail for, for, for general neglect, not just egregious, you know, f uh, violent animal crimes. I've seen a shift, though, I think, over time to where now if, if there is neglect, uh, you know, people are being put on short probation. And, um, you know, California is kind of an example. Some of the laws changing and being uh, downgraded, for lack of a better word, or, the, or the, you know, the, uh, the potential penalties. Yeah, it's just, uh, you know, a multitude of cases that I was exposed to early in my career that, uh, that you know, really kind of drove home the need for um, improved laws. Um, so, yeah, I worked on 20 laws in my, or 22, actually, my career in Carolina, and I uh, feel pretty proud about that. Yeah, but what was it about the animals themselves that struck you? Because, once again, uh, it's one thing to be upset about the law and not having equal justice, but what was it about the animal sense that got to you just as a human being, as a sentient being? All right. All right. Well, I mean, I've always had animals since I was a little kid and, you know, they're living, breathing creature, creatures. They feel pain. They suffer. 
it, it just boggles my mind, you know, as long as I've been doing this, that, you know, people shouldn't, certain people should just shouldn't have animals, period. To see any animal suffer, you know, really got to me. And, and that was the, the way I could make it, make a change in, in Carolina. And ultimately out here in California, too, I used to go to the, the Capitol a good bit on animal laws. Yeah, but it seems to be that it was your prime motivator because, as you pointed out, uh, you were kind of like a one-man lobbying group in South Carolina for all those years you were there to try to change the laws and then moved out to to California, and you're continuing to do the same sort of thing. So uh, there's got to be something there uh, about your love for animals. Yeah, no, I I truly believe all animals should be treated humanely. Um, A a case in point, I guess, I remember a case out of, uh, I believe it was down in San Diego a couple of years back, and all animals are covered in California law. And it was a situation where some kids went into an aquarium and uh, uh, doused these animals. I think they put bleach in the tanks and all that, and they were prosecuted uh, under California Penal Code 597. So Yes, I honestly believe all animals should should be protected. That was one of my frustrations in my career when when legislators did want to carve out certain exemptions in animal law, you know, and it was like no animal, you know, as far as I'm concerned, no animal suffers less because of the type of you know animal it is. Like gamecocks were, were a big thorn, um, or, or actually a, a big issue in South Carolina for many years. Um, you know, improving the penalties for that. Uh, we were able to get a felony animal fighting law, but uh, game fowl were exempt uh, in Carolina for many years till there was a big uh, blow up about some uh, higher officials that had uh, been involved with uh, some nefarious activities. So when people say, oh, uh, Henry, you're kind of a animal rights guy, uh, what do you say? You know, I don't see anything wrong with animal rights. I mean, people unfortunately paint, you know, a, a negative picture about animal rights. A lot of times, uh, things need to be exposed. Um, I do it through the legal process, uh, and I, I do believe animals should have rights. I mean, there's there's things that, uh, you know, there's been an, a slow evolution in that realm about, you know, oh, they're just personal property. You know, that they're not living, feeling, breathing creatures. Again, I work for a county uh, governmental agency, but, uh, you know, we, we, we look out for every animal possible, you know, whatever what comes our way. You know, we've, we've had some cases even with hoarders, uh, with like reptiles and stuff like that, that, you know, they, they just, uh, they got to have, <laughs> you know, one of everything, which is, is mind boggling. Yeah, well, Henry, we do want to talk about hoarding and focus in on that. Uh, And it's really something that makes no sense. Uh, People who say they like animals, but they take in so many of them that it becomes cruelty. In your career, tell me about some of those cases you've dealt with. Well, you know, one thing that I've, I've said to people in my career, and I saw a publication a long time ago, um, there was a case in upstate New York, um, just, um, just after I started working, I actually worked for the Humane Society of the United States as a field investigator at one point in my career. Uh, but killing with kindness, I think, is 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 apropos for these folks. I understand some mental illness and people need you know need help, but you know to to go in and uh, just keep taking in more and more animals as as a, somewhat of an addiction. Um, yeah, I. I dealt with a lot of different unique cases over the years. One that, um, one that comes to mind, well, several, but, uh, one that comes to mind in Carolina, we worked, our office was situated out of a a city animal shelter and behind my desk was a glass window with a a cattery. And this one individual would regularly come in. I'm pretty good with identifying people, you know, faces and names. And he'd come in and he'd spend a long time in the cat room. Uh, let's fast forward to it was Memorial Day weekend. A bunch of staff were off duty, and the sheriff's department um, contacted me from an, a jurisdiction that we collaborated with, but we didn't normally work in Kershaw County, uh, stating that there had been a fire in a mobile home, and there were just cats everywhere. 
uh, you know, deceased uh, because of smoke inhalation. So I responded uh, working with uh, a lieutenant up there and uh, so the sheriff as well. And uh, this individual, um, upon you know further investigation, was like collecting cats wherever he would go on the side of the road. Um, we uh, there was one concern at one point about whether it was there deceased human beings on the property they brought in cadaver dogs. So this this case kind of like blew up with the media. I'll never forget it with all the satellite trucks. Anyway, that being said, we interviewed this person. And he was basically, he would pick, he, he couldn't think of any animal being disposed of, other, you know, in any other way than in his refrigerator. So he would bring animals, cats that had died on the side of the road. He proceeded to tell us he was the cat man and he wore a, um, oh, what do you call it, like a coveralls with the name on there when he would go to work and that he would douse himself with the vinegar to, to, to cover up the cat smell, but that one really sunk in in my mind. Uh, one of the, the bigger cases because there was cats in the dropped ceiling that you know this, he had like a hole cut out, and there were just cats coming to go, and it was just you could smell sadly the death around the property because cats have been buried all over his property over time. That sounds like one of the more extreme cases, I would say. Yeah, yeah, it was. Uh, there was some other uh, very bizarre sexually related material, um, on that, that crime scene. Um, and, and, and definitely a, a, um, a person that clearly should have a no possess. And that's what I like about California. We do have the five year misdemeanor, no possess and 10 year, um, felony, no possess. I wish it was longer. I wish it was a lifetime ban. I understand people, you know, do their time to society and they should be free and clear. But we've used that here in our county several times uh, when we get our our orders of probation. Without getting the specifics, we have a repeat offender who was prosecuted by us that was clearly a hoarder um, and uh, is is, is still trying to dabble in uh, the world of uh, collecting animals. Would you say, Henry, that uh, how many states would have this kind of uh, ban on ownership? Is California one of the few or is it common? I know at one point there was an attempt, I believe, up in Oregon to to make it a lifetime ban and that, that did not happen. Um, I do think legislatively we need like almost like in here, California, we have the Megan's Law, you know, where people are um, sex offenders are registered. We need animal, um, you know, uh, crimes, felons in a, in a database. Um, there was an attempt, it was an attempt in the past to, uh, to do that, um, as well as like a dangerous dog registry. But, but the, the one thing that's interesting though, is if you have a five year no possess or a 10 year no possess, you know, once you're off probation, we can't do a, a searchable. In other words, you're open to search and seize, but we can, you know, if we catch you out in public, um, you know, we can we can charge you with that. Uh, that uh, it's a crime. And um, we had somebody years ago. Um, this person wasn't a hoarder. This person was a, a importing um, dogs from Korea and um, pointing them off as little micro dogs uh, when they were just you know three four weeks of age. And that was a case that we um, executed a search on, and we caught them later on in possession of animals, and they were brought back to stand before our superior court judge and ultimately sentenced to uh, additional jail time. So, you know, leaving to the hoarding, my concern currently is that shelters are so full, you know, across the country, people are walking away from animals and that my hope is that shelters don't get um, some, you know, get bamboozled into thinking, Oh yeah, this person's great. They're going to take a bunch of cats or dogs off our hands. Um, you know, point, Point being, a recent case we had here where we had a German Shepherd rescue person, um, and I don't like that word. I I call it animal, um, you know, welfare group. They train because we rescue animals too, uh, but they uh, we worked hard to to ultimately get a search warrant on that person's house with uh, 12, 12 adult dogs living in a small bedroom. Um, and you know, I never say it's the worst house I've been to, but uh, it's pretty disgusting. And this person. Um, again, was hoarding, collecting these German shepherds and wouldn't let them go, you know, um, 
to to homes. There are people that pose as rescue groups uh, under the guise of continuing their collection of animals. Is that how common is that? Um, I think it's more common than we know of, you know, um, uh, you know, they, that's what, and here's why I think it's so important for animal services agencies to, before you commit, and most of them do commit to working with a group a so-called rescue group that you, you go out and you find out, you know, where, how they're housing animals, how many animals they have, you know, how they got in the proper permits, um, in other words, our county here, we have a commercial animal establishment permit. And if you um, transact either via sale, barter, or hire, you must have this commercial animal establishment permit. And of course, you, you need to be um, zoned for that as well. Like that individual with the 25 shepherds was not zoned. But um, that's a way for us to keep a handle on um, these so-called uh, you know, rescuers slash hoarders. Yeah. You know, that, uh, that term hoarding, uh, we still don't have a, a, a good handy definition. Uh, how would you define hoarding? Because it seems like, you know, we've talked about some extremes, but there seems to be a, a spectrum, if you will. So how would you define hoarding? First and foremost, on a base level, I think it's, it's what you can comfortably care for. And that's when you get past that threshold of hoarding where you know, maybe you, you live in an area and you, you know, have a large backyard and you can devote your time to say, you know, six, eight dogs, but, um, the hoarding gets to the point where, you know, um, you're, you're spending your whole day cleaning up after the animals and you let them continually reproduce. You're not, you're not practicing, you know, this good spay neuter, um, uh, procedures, you know, policy and you're, you're in over your head and the environment just goes, you know, downhill. Um, I attended a training one time and a lot of folks were talking about not prosecuting hoarders and I disagreed. I was like, they need to be in the criminal justice system because a lot of times what they do is they just up and move and go to another jurisdiction. Um, I didn't even touch on one case that we had that was just the most egregious case from a standpoint, even of psychological well-being, which is you know, not a component of, of uh, animal law, except on, on a federal level for um, primates. But we had a house here in El Dorado County with 300 dogs in, in one house um, and about 30, 30 um, uh, equines. And, you know, just crates stacked on top of each other. And it was the, 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 the sound of the stress level, um, you know, psychological impact on these dogs all barking in that house. You know, what a life to, to live in a crate and to be put outside, you know, on a deck to go to the bathroom and then put back in a crate. And um, these folks claimed all kinds of they were doing uh, research for animal food um, and uh just unbelievable. Um, they they had been a chronic issue in here in our county. Tell me, what's it like to walk into a home like that? Because I, I imagine you did have to do that. What's it like to walk into an animal hoarder's home? It is overwhelming, for for sure, for staff. The animals are, are frightened just because of the life they've lived. You can call it a life. And um, very difficult to remove the animals. You want to remove them humanely. You don't want the, the, the animal owners um, around because they're just they're going to make things worse for the animals. But um, these actually individuals, after they were um, charged, basically we had to do a search warrant and sit on the property and keep the search warrant active for several days, night and day, to continue to remove animals because there were still cats as well, kittens all over the property besides the dogs in the house. And uh, when Ultimately, we got uh, we got another search warrant down the road, and for them to be arrested. And when we went to the house, they had more animals, so they were back at it again. How many square feet is the home? That house was probably just ballpark. I think it was probably about a forty five hundred square foot house. But they had animals just you know smeared uh, feces you know rooms in the back. Um, they had um, they were you know, really. Um, Boston Terriers were their thing, but they had other breeds as well. Um, and it was just 
yeah, I, that one will never leave my mind on on what we saw. And the thing where you know you talk about kind of um, this issue being a mental illness. I mean, when you talk to people, they don't they don't get it. They don't comprehend. Um, you know what what they're doing to the animals it just it's 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 mind boggling um well, well tell me henry how does this happen how does how does someone go from one or two animals to uh how many were in the dog uh, situation with the boston terriers uh, several hundred yeah there were there were a total of almost 300 uh, dogs in the house yeah you can imagine that how does that happen? You go from one to two animals to 300. You know, just having litters of puppies and just, they can't, you can't let them go. You know, I, I've heard people say that sometimes we're trying to work with some people right now to get their animals spayed and neutered. Um, kind of a star story that started out kind of a neglect, but they were out of town. Um, but without getting into all the intricate details, they could be, I mean, they're, they could be potential hoarders. I mean, they're like at the point, it's not pro- it's not prosecutable, but where oh we have a litter oh we just can't give up these puppies they're so cute, you know oh we were just going to keep one but now let's keep six and then oh we didn't get around to spaying and neutering and oh that's not so bad I want a, I want one of these I want another litter because these puppies look like that so it's either that or it's it's people that even um you know go around and and pick up animals off the street and set up their own little you know group without even interacting with the public. I've had another interesting case that, uh, you know, these folks were calling themselves a rescue group and they were, you know, like a sanctuary. But I was told that by them in person, you had to be God to adopt an animal from me when I questioned them about what their procedures were. Um, and they, uh, they wanted to move up to our County and our County was, you know, trying we were trying to do the right thing to the planning department. Um, there were another jurisdiction and I ultimately was able to see, you know, the animals they had in this other jurisdiction. And it was just, their house was full of cats everywhere, interior, exterior. Um, I, I think looking back again, it was just overwhelming for them. They had their carpet all ripped up, uh, all kinds of things. I think what ultimately came out of that was we did better for the animals because they did move to our County and we put a variety of restrictions on them, a limit of animals. And they basically had this giant animal sanctuary, but you know, they, they, the thing that got me was we're going to help your County out with a cat problem. And I never really um, saw anything besides them just being, you know, a a legal um, place for them to house a bunch of cats, you know, but they, they moved them from the cages. They had them in one County to an open giant, um, you know, well, well done. I will say, um, you know, uh, building a structure strictly for the cats, but it was almost like their hobby of hoarding. Tell me about that. Uh, continuing on our definition of hoarding, you have seen so many cases at this point. Is there a hoarder profile that you can spot immediately? Yeah. The, the ones that I've seen, uh, Tufts university, has put out some stuff, you know, they've called them animal collectors in the past. And a lot of times it, uh, the profile is somebody that's had some type of devastating loss in their life. Uh, you know, family member, you know, parents or whatever in general, I do say it's uh, females, uh, middle-aged, uh, you know, again, I talked about the cat hoarder. That was a man, you know, and, and, and I'm not saying that the, the, that it's not a bad thing, but he may like, again, we were talking about it before they started they may, maybe with good intent and, and got in over their head, but, uh, it's a lifestyle in a way though, too, because of the way that they, um, you know, live with, um, not only with the animals, but their, their environment, you know, that's, it's just, um, clutter and, um, courting other things. It's really difficult too to search houses like that because, First of all, you're trying to find every animal and not leave any animal there. And then you're also, you know, looking for evidence of any kind of uh, veterinary bills or other long-term type things. So it's, uh, it's very chaotic and on scene. Yeah, but there's no way to really prevent this until you're already knee deep in this problem, right? I mean, you don't get called out until 
there are 300 dogs and cats and not when there are like five or six. Right. You're absolutely right. It's usually um, a tip by a neighbor um, you, or you have, um, you know, somebody's neighbor, depending on, you know, the property size, of course, but you either have, you know, odors finally coming out from the house that are alarming to people, you know, or barking complaints that can alert. Um, and that's why I, I, when I train my officers, I'm like, you know, a, your search or your, your, your basis, your probable cause to get a search warrant is your, you know, your sight, the sound, your, your smell, you go to a house and you're smelling, you know, feces emanating from a house and you see flies on the windowsill, um, you know, and you hear lots of dogs barking, you're probably going into a hoarding environment and it's time to get a search warrant. And, you know, every animal service agency, you know, goes by the book and they're very cautious. The downside is sometimes the public is like, why, you know, why don't you go in there right away? It's like, well, you know, people have rights and we have to get the evidence that we need, you know, to, to obtain a search warrant and execute it. I mean, what do people tell you when you ask them, you, you know, you're, you're living in six inches of feces and animals are starving and dying around, around them. And, you know, they claim to be animal lovers. Uh, what do they say? They make astonishing comments. I'll say that you, you, now you bring another case that happened in uh, within the city uh, jurisdiction here where this house was basically had been um, red tagged, not habitable living structure. And the electric box, so it's safety for community as well. The electric uh, breaker box on the wall, they, the surrounding wall had very much rotted out and the box was hanging. Um, this particular individual, um, a hoarder as well, was not even living in the house. She was living in her car. There was some issues family-wise as well and, and, and tr- for her to, to get uh, even the title transfer of the house. Neighbors started reporting smells because it was hot summer. My officer went over there and could smell, you know, feces and urine emanating for the house. Um, so we got the search warrant. We go in there and the house is just, you know, feces everywhere. Dogs, you know, um, I think there was like 12 dogs and uh, four cats. So it was low level hoarding, but the house was smeared. I mean, we tie, we put Tyvex on. So I went and I interviewed the, the um, you know, the person that was housing these animals in the house. And she straight up stated to me, you know who I, you know, I, what kind of person I am and you know, I'm going to do it again. That was pretty telling. Um, on that case, we brought mental health with us because um, we were concerned for the person's well being, even though, you know, she was being investigated. Um, and that one was a sad one too, that sticks in my mind because she had re- and I'll put in quotes, rescued a dog. And originally we thought that she had this one particular dog, you know, maybe it harmed it. The dog had broken legs on the front. The dog was walking around in feces with, you know, two broken legs, just, you know, squishing around in the house. And we found out that she had taken this dog from somebody that was unhoused um, down in the Sacramento area and brought the dog up here. Uh, clearly in this situation, either the dog needed major orthopedic surgery or possibly euthanasia. And it was just appalling to see this poor dog living there. Now she didn't create the, 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 the breaks or anything, the animal crime or had occurred prior to the animal neglect, but she clearly was neg- neglecting this animal allowed. That was really heartbreaking to see that, that one. Yeah. And, and Henry, how common is it that you'll have people claiming that they're part of a rescue group and they're really hoarding situations. I would probably say on average up here, you know, about every other month or so we, we, we catch one. Some, some of them are more like clandestine, you know, they don't want to, they want to be found. That's why we're, like I said, when we, we enter into uh, these contracts with these, these different groups to work with our shelter, you know, we rescue animals too. If they're from another jurisdiction, we will contact and I, I strongly advise us, we'll contact the uh, animal services agency for that county or city and reach out and say, hey, these people want to pull some animals from our shelter. What do you know about them? And sometimes they're like, wow, we never heard about them. Well, can you look into them? You know, and 
I mean, of course, we require the group that we work with to have a 501c3. They're out there and they're all over the place. Do, and um, Are they breaking any laws by claiming that they're a rescue group? They could be if they're collecting donations and things like that. You know, that that could be one. Um, not registering, usually with like, depending on what state you're in, with the Secretary of State's office or the Attorney General's office for misuse of funds. A lot of jurisdictions have, you know, limits on how many animals you can have on the property. And that's why I like that we have, you know, our our, our commercial animal establishment and non-commercial animal establishment permit. That's how we can keep a lid on people and, you know, and check on them regularly if they go through the process legally. They could be violating <clears throat> clearly um, zoning ordinances uh, based on, you know, um, either unable to properly sanitize or disinfect or control the runoff from, um, you know, say they have animals in kennels. Clearly, uh, uninhabitable living structures when the feces and everything is just overwhelming the house, you know, the code enforcement folks will come out normally with us and, and red tag properties uh, and get people into compliance. One of, the la- one of the most recent cases we had where we honestly, there was no water set up for a, a toilet and I know this is gross, but th- we believe this person was using the dog litter ba- bags to go to the bathroom. And uh, that's just so that that particular house was red tagged. So one of the things that gets me is that uh, I guess, uh, you know, at some point you, you have to say enough's enough. Uh, but then when does when's that tipping point when, you know, I, I would imagine for normal people when they see feces and they have trouble feeding and they, they can't even take care of uh, litters, uh, they would say, okay, no more. But that doesn't tend to stop the hoarder. They keep going. Right, right. And, you know, I go back to if, if you don't get reports. Um, when I've done some talks in the past, I've always told people to, it's like, um, you know, don't wait until it's too late. Let us let the agency know and, and let's look into it and find out what's what's occurring on that property. Are you talking about people self-reporting or are you talking about neighbors watching? Out- no, na- neighbor, neighbors reporting. Yeah, hoarders, hoarders are not normally going to tip off the agencies to, uh, you know, that there's there's something going on. Yeah, you know that, and that—that's where you have the fine line of: is it animal cruelty or is it just too many animals? If you don't have a jurisdiction that has a limit on animals, it could be a dilemma because if they're if they're keeping it clean, you know, maybe it's psychologically not good to pack up, a, you know, fifty dogs in your house. If you're not violating zoning laws or you're not violating violating any animal cruelty laws, and you know, agencies sometimes cannot do things. By the way, I I did look up, and I'm I'm pleasantly surprised that animal cruelty laws that restrain future ownership of animals. Uh, as of 2023, 39 states that have such laws. Um, generally, they apply only to felony convictions except for a couple of states. So that's uh, that's that's nice. And I'll, I'll continue to read more about that. So you were talking about what people should do if they suspect a hoarder. Uh, specific things they can do? Start both with the local animal services, animal uh, care and control agency. Uh, start talking to the local code enforcement people too. Um, we collaborate and work, you know, together with our code enforcement folks. We normally bring them out when we're doing a search warrant. At the same time, usually there's other issues with, you know, faulty wiring, you know, potential for, uh, you know, a fire in the community because of, you know, the excessive clutter that they keep. Now we've talked about some of the excessive cases, but how, and, and those are always going to grab attention and make news, but how common is everyday garden variety hoarding that goes under the radar? Uh, is there such a thing? And is that something to be wary of? Yeah, I'm sure there is. Um, you know, what they say, what, what goes on behind closed doors whether you have uh, people in rural areas, our, our county is a kind of a rural suburban interface. And I always, in the back of my mind, always wonder what's out there, you know, in these, in these, um, you know, five, 10 
well, more like 10 to, to, you know, 20 acre parcels, you know, where they have a barn or, or whatever, or, you know, even in, 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 in city areas where, you know, people live in an apartment and maybe they have 20 dogs in there, but I don't know. I, I wouldn't put it past some orders to even possibly debark animals. I've never encountered that, but that that's a possibility. You know, one, one case that really is burned in my brain when I, I, it's right. I had been in this business a couple of years and it happened in upstate New York. And it was, um, the guy was called Dr. Doolittle. I mean, this goes way back to the early eighties. He was actually an article about him in the reader's digest and how he's such a great guy. And he's fine. Probably one of the first big hoarding cases, how he would, uh, rescue all these animals. Well, fast forward, they found out that he was buying like bread from like, you know, a couple day old bread from, you know, like one of these bakeries in upstate New York and just thrown out to the dogs. And it, it was the photos I saw of that, that animal seizure, you know, hundreds of animals living in barns and feces uh, with, you know, basically on the scale of, you know, zero to 10 uh, for the body condition. These animals were like, you know, zero, zero point five, one. Uh, it was just, it was appalling. And um, it's probably the first one that really, you know, Again, that was the one I think there was an article quoted, killing with kindness, you know, just collecting every animal in the world. But, you know, any any life is better than death attitude. Does that prove to you that that adage is not true? It is. It's it's there's 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 sometimes there's, you know, reasons. I mean, for euthanasia, it's just a reality. We're fortunate here in our shelter. Something's aggressive in a public safety concern. You know, we're not going to expose the public to harm, children, you know, adults, whatever, you know, or or severe medical. Now, again, we're fortunate here that we have a a donor fund. It's called Pet Aid, where people can, uh, you know, donate, and we can do um, extra you know, means to make an animal uh, that's treatable, adoptable. We've been lucky when we've seized animals; we've been able to rehome those animals and give them a great future at, at great expense. I will say to my staff. This last uh, case with the 25 shepherds, the person posted the lien as required by California law within 14 days. They they paid the lien and then they released 11 of the 25. So we were able to place those, but we're required by law when you post a lien to house those animals pending adjudication of the case. So in that instance, my staff and these dogs, a lot of them were not socialized. They were there were almost a danger, several, about the three, two to three that come to mind um, that we, you know, staff had gotten bitten, but we were, you know, required to keep them as, as property still. This individual, ultimately, we did what was called a K petition, where we stated, even if we were to, to not prevail in, in the criminal case, that she was not zoned to have those animals, um, she never applied for the proper permits, and um, ultimately, at the time when we did the plea, we were going to do the K petition. She forfeited. She d- decided to plead out and forfeit those animals. But we were ready to, to get the rest of those animals. The poor dogs had, you know, stayed in our shelter for probably six months, which totally impacted our operation. Um, so, yeah, Henry, uh, I really appreciate your time and talking about this. Is there uh, some hope you can leave us with? Is the uh, the amount of hoarding that you're finding out there less than it has been? Where's the trend? Are we trending uh, positively down or are we still at a point where it is a crisis? It, it is a crisis. And I, I don't think we're trending down, you know, clearly in society, we have a lot of men, mental health, you know, concerns and issues, you know, with people and that, some of those people end up becoming hoarders. So I think there's more hoarders out there than we know about. And they're good about keeping uh, under the radar. Um, And that's why I guess my thoughts would be, you know, make sure as an animal service agency or humane society that runs, you know, um, animal sheltering for your communities to Keep an eye on people who come into your shelter. You know, not the we open our doors to all, but you know, just be cautious. You know, if somebody keeps coming back to the shelter and you know they want this cat, they want that cat, and then you talk to your your neighboring jurisdictions and find out, oh yeah, they get cats from us too. 
there's probably a, a concern going on there. And, you know, we'll do welfare checks on people on occasion if we have some concerns. You know, we want to respect people's rights. But um, I, I think hoarding is, is, has not decreased. I, and I, I think there's a lot more out there than we know. Henry Przinsky, El Dorado County Animal Services Chief in uh, California. Thank you for being on the PETA Podcast. You're quite welcome. Thank you, Emil. Henry Brzezinski, head of El Dorado County Animal Services in Northern California, on the crisis that is animal hoarding. See more at PETA.org. And that's it for our show today. Thank you for listening. Don't forget to send a link of this show to your friends. Tell them you like the PETA podcast. Contact us at PETA.org. You can find me on Twitter at Emil Amok. That's E-M-I-L-A-M-O-K. Or see my vlog at amok.com. Or see my work at ALDEF, the Asian American Legal Defense and Education Fund. That's ALDEF, A-A-L-D-E-F dot org slash blog. Or get this podcast on YouTube at Emil Amok One. Once again, thank you for listening. Check out all our episodes on your favorite podcast app or on Apple Podcasts, where you can subscribe to as well as rate and review the show. It helps get the word out about the issues you care about. Our music is provided by Carbon Works. Check them out on YouTube. And join us again next time for more insight into animal rights and the fight for a cruelty-free world on The PETA Podcast. I'm Emil Guillermo.